When I look at the world and all the crises that we've been through, but also and mainly the crises that we are going to go through, I think we need a soft touch, a beautiful vision of the world. And I was lucky enough to be invited this summer at IPFO, which is the International Photo Festival in Alton, Switzerland. And there I've met with Eric Medican Eck, who is often called a fashion photographer, which he hates. And I understand why, because he truly is an artist that happened to do photography as a support for his artwork. And he's an amazing person because, well, he has studied political science. He's only 37. I was named one of the top study on the study by Forbes. He won many awards, even though he's super young. And his artwork is just breathtaking to be honest and with him we talk about romanticism for sure but also about manhood about vulnerability and all that you can think that is connected to it we also talk about the projection that an artist makes when he creates and the energy that he's sending to the world i think it's a very beautiful and insightful conversation so i hope you'll enjoy it allez vlan c'est parti So, hi everyone. Hi, Eric. Hello. How are you doing today? Fantastic. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm pretty good myself. You're pretty, I'm pretty okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, we're going to talk about your work, but I wanted to talk about romanticism. Yeah. Romanticism. Is that right? Romanticism, yeah. Romanticism. I'm bad with my yeah, English no, no. sometimes. C'est bon. <laughs> I'm bad with my English sometimes. Yeah, mon français c'est très bon, mais... Hey! <laughs> But people will be happy that you, to know that you'll, you speak French a little bit. Un petit peu. <laughs> uh, but well, we'll do the interview in English though. It's going to be easier and I guess more interesting if you like. <laughs> Super. <laughs> um, first question basically is, how did you went to photography? I guess that that's the very first question, but... And more than photography, because you told me you would not describe yourself as a fashion photographer, but more as an artist, um, how did you went into art? And why did you choose photography in the first place? Yes, yeah, so I began um, as a child painting with my mother um, since probably four, we would paint almost every day in the basement, watercolors, um, you know, just abstract and landscapes. And I would kind of copy my mother and what she was doing and learned quite young how to mix colors, how to see composition. She used to take me to the museums every week. Um, so I was always surrounded with art. And then when I was 14, she um, bought me a camera because I was super into music. So I used to DJ I mean, I still do a bit, but I used to spend all my money on records and I would be in my bedroom, um, you know, six, six hours a day, like just mixing records. And so she was, she was, I was like, you have to go out to the world and, <laughs> and not just be in your bedroom. So she bought me a camera, I think, to try to get me out of the room. Um, so we had this ritual every Sunday, she would take me, uh, out in her car And she would say, you know, here's one roll of film, take whatever pictures you want. And that was the, her way of kind of introducing me to photography. So I think immediately it just made sense. Like the, the, the framing of the world with the camera came very easy. And I think, you know, psychologically, if something comes easy, you like it immediately oh, yeah. Yeah. because you're like, Oh, I'm good at this. Um, I also had very nurturing parents who were like, you're very good at this. <laughs> you know, so there's <laughs> a po immediate positive reinforcement. Um, so I started out shooting black and white, um, tri -X 35 millimeter film. And then I would go to the dark room in my high school and I had a fantastic, uh, high school photography teacher who really took me under her wing and helped me, learn how to develop, uh, prints. And so it just became like kind of immediately became a, a, a passion. Um, but at the time I was also, you know, I was playing soccer and, you know, I was, I was engaged in many other things, but I think photography immediately 
made sense and I knew that it was something I probably was going to do for the rest of my life. Right. Yeah. So it was quite, it was quite young. And so as you describe me, you don't do only photography, you do different things. Yeah. So how, where would you put photography in the different things you're doing? Right. Well, I mean, so for many years, that's all I did. So like 14 to probably mid twenties, I was very only Focus. shooting black and white photography, which is funny because now I only shoot color. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I, I was like a, a student of photography as well, like just on my own. So I went out to the bookshops and, you know, um, became kind of encyclopedia of photography from the origins, like daguerreotypes through the, you know, the classics like Henri Cartier, Brisson, uh, in, in the United States, like we had a Harry Callahan in the sixties. Okay. So I had this sort of encyclopedic knowledge, I think within two years of, of what photography at the time was considered, um, until you get to Eggleston, which it was funny. I really hated Eggleston and his approach to color. And I had this very sort of classical idea that photography had to be black and white. It had to adhere to these, um, sort of decisive moment, um, parameters in, you know, documentary, um, catching that, that perfect moment and these compositions that were very graphic But really the whole time I wasn't passionate about photography as well. I really looked at painting and my love was always painting. Like when I would go to the museums, I wasn't really interested in the, the photography exhibitions. Like I'd be more interested in um, contemporary painters, like post-war painters like Gerhard Richter, right. uh, Luke Toymans. Um, and I always wanted to be a painter, but I was very good at photography. And so there's a sort uh. of, uh, dichotomy in my mind of what I was good at and what I wanted to be. And so I think it was in graduate school where I started to experiment with color, but I really wanted to use photography to make paintings. Right. Um, because also with photography, it's immediate or you can spend time <clears throat> obviously with the color and post, but as opposed to a painting where you have to invent photography, you can take and then invent on top of it. Um, and so that, that, that was the crux is like 10 years of wanting to be a painter, being good at photography and then figuring out how to be a painter using photography. <laughs> I, I don't know if you realize how reassuring it is to, to hear about, one of the top photographer telling, well, you know, I did photography because I was not, I mean, I wanted to be a painter, but <laughs> yeah, that but I'm was... also quite impatient. So like for me, you know, the idea of sitting down with the canvas for, you know, weeks yeah. uh, to really get to the place that I could possibly get in like two days with a photograph. I was like, yeah, well, yeah, I'd rather just take the picture. And at the same <laughs> time, so when I look at your photography, but it's also what people say, Instantly, when they say when you saw your when they see your job is, it makes you think of of painting. It's insane. Like when I look at the photography, I was like, but this is painting, and yeah. I don't know how you do. How, how I mean, I'm wondering how do you do that? Well, so essentially, it's you know I always say that the the photograph, if you're speaking correctly about the medium, like when I take the picture, that's sort of just the blank canvas because the majority of my time is spent afterwards uh, building color on top and on top and on top until, you know, the original image is very far from the final picture that I show. Oh, right. And so the colors are kind of invented on top of this place. And sometimes I'll rearrange elements in the, in the actual composition as well. Um, but the, you know, there might be a hundred layers of color on top of a picture oh, wow. and it might take a couple of weeks actually of going back, stopping, adding more color, taking color away. So the process is, is pretty much identical to painting. Yeah. That's what except, I was thinking. Yeah. Except that, you know, with painting, you have to start from nothing with my process. We're starting with a picture huh. 
that existed in the world, but then is changed dramatically. Super interesting. It's very, I never heard anyone telling that story, actually. Yeah. Or work that way. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people are using Lightroom to improve their photos, right. but that's a different level. That's so, something different, very really different. Well, it's, it's, it's literally very basic. It's sort of just doing color layers over and over and over. And the, the thing is that when you when you layer color, just like in painting, like it flattens the space. And the the main distinction between photography and painting is depth in terms of, um, you know, in, inherently in photography, you have this sort of realistic sense of space with shadows. And um, in painting, things are flat. I mean, unless you're talking about, yeah. you know, photorealistic painting, but so the, the more that you layer color, it flattens the space and it gets rid of mm. shadows and it, it kind of takes over these, um, the areas of the photograph that would make it distinguishably real. So the more color that I add, the more it looks like a painting, you know? And why did you, I mean, I don't know how you arrived in fashion, but, <laughs> but I'm interested to understand yeah. why, because when you were talking about the beginning and how your mother bring you in a place to take photos, I would start, oh, maybe you could become like a, a war photographer or, you know, a street right. photographer or, and so fashion is very, you know, posed. It's, it's not like on the go. It's, uh, well, so fashion as its own medium was something I was very interested in as well. And, uh, at university, I moved to Paris um, my sec second year and I was, I had already in a separate encyclopedia of sort of avant-garde fashion that I loved a lot of the Belgians, like Andy Meester, mm -hmm. um, the Japanese that like, come to Garçon who at the time, this was the early two thousands were still kind of at, at the, the at the totally. heights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, that was a totally separate interest, but then I wanted to work with them, um, like a very subset of fashion. And I started reaching out to them. So when I was in Paris, um, you know, I, I ended up becoming friends with Anne Demi sir, just through, through actually sending her prints and, and beginning this dialogue. And then, you know, I kind of found myself in this niche where, I was doing pictures for like John Battista Valli and A Magazine and, and Heider Ackerman when he first was uh, exhibiting at Pitti Umo in Florence. And I kind of wanted to carve out this niche of just working with people that I admired their work as opposed to taking a sort of normal uh, route, which would be like assisting another fashion photographer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I didn't really, I wasn't interested per se in fashion photography. I just knew. I wanted to make art. I wanted to make photos that looked like paintings. And I also wanted to work with these designers that I felt were artists as well. So it was this sort of mutual love of like, okay, I love what you do. I want to use what you do in my work to make pictures that also incorporated uh, fashion that was really spectacular, you know, as opposed to going down some sort of route of, um, being a utilitarian photographer in fashion, just documenting, yeah, yeah. you know, it was more like, I want to make art. I want to make art with you guys. How can we do that? Yeah. It's really different. I mean, it's a different approach. So it's a different process eventually. Yeah. And so we discussed about together about romanticism and engagement. And I think it's always very interesting to discuss with men about, uh, romanticism and, uh, sensibility because, most men don't like accept uh, the sensibility. So right. uh, I would love us to talk about that because I think that is super interesting. Uh, and first question probably is um, what for you is romanticism and how do you react when people say that your work is a reinvention of romanticism somehow? I think romanticism to me is... Well, historically, it was a period of time. So you had the origins in Germany with like Caspar David Frederick, who mm -hmm. if you trace now to the, uh, the 
post-war painters like Anselm Kiefer, um, you could even probably go to the Belgians like Luc Toymans and Marlene Dumas, who really use color and sort of um, gestures towards the sublime uh, as the basis for that movement. But I think when I talk about romanticism, it it is really about sort of internalizing your uh, viewpoint of the world in a way that is non-cynical and more hopeful and, and also really is to me, it becomes about, um, how you can communicate your sort of love for the world through art, as opposed to commenting on modern society. I think there's a distinction between analytical art or art that's made to try to illustrate a point about where we are today Mm -hmm. versus art that you make kind of from your soul that uh, becomes part of a a larger timeline where, you know, when people talk about romantic art, they firstly say like it, it's timeless. That's, that's the sort of tagline. Um, And I think that's a true, it's true because we all exist in this continuum where if something's great, I think it inherently will kind of transcend time. And I think it transcends race and gender and sexual preference. You know, there's a reason that we all gravitates like towards flowers and sunsets and those sort of, you know, cliche things that we all um, can enjoy that becomes romanticism, you know, Mm. and it's, it's really a, it's a distinction of, of making art from a place of, I suppose, commentary in cynicism versus making art from a place of being a hopeful human who wants to show love through their work. So that's what you want to do, showing love? I think so. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Nice. It's a, it, I mean, it's a beautiful objective somehow. So somebody's sharing love. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you, you know, it, it's much easier to say the world is fucked up. Look at CNN. Hmm. Uh, let's make a painting of a, of a photograph of a kid in, a, in Guantanamo Bay. And we can all sit around and say, yeah, 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 that's fucked up. And put likes on Instagram. And, and hmm. you know, how dare the world be this way? It's much harder to, to, you know, hold a kid's hand and be a good father and make a work of art where it's about something that is positive. I think it becomes much more difficult because you, you get in the realm of sort of people immediately pushing back and saying, oh, that's cliche or that's, you know, that's a postcard or blah, blah, blah. But I think... I think with my work, I want people to be happy and come away from it and feel fulfilled as opposed mm. to um, reinforcing all the bad things that we already know exist. Right. You know. So everything that you say, and I said that already, but it's uh, very logical, but it's very sensitive. And, and so I'm wondering how, as a man, because mm. we are not most men, uh, taught, uh, so, um, how do you get access to your sensibility? I mean, I think I was just very lucky with being raised by parents who are very loving and, um, you know, instilled in me a sense of love from a child where, you know, that was felt. And I think when you're given love from your family and you're taught as a young person that, that's the priority in life. I think you carry that with you, whether you're a man or a woman. A woman. I mean, I think it's pretty basic. I don't know if it's that basic because 
Honestly, it's it's a huge issue in the society. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, patriarchy is re is a, it's real. Like it's not just uh, a concept. So it's it's a real issue. Like those men that, and patriarchy to me, I mean, both uh, men and women are suffering from it. More women than men, but men also because men are taught uh, you should not cry, right. uh, you should not, you should be strong, you should be blah 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 blah, and that's that's also killing. Uh, not killing, but uh, it's killing a lot of women, but it's also um, destroying, let's say, uh, some well, women. I think, you know, as a father, so I have two ch two boys and a third boy on the way oh, in five weeks. <laughs> um, but I make it a point, you know, every day to kiss them many times, hold their hand in public. You know, I read them books that night. I cuddle with them. I show them uh, a lot of physical affection Because I think, like you're saying, you know, it's hard for men to do that. And so, but if you receive that as an early age, that's normal to you. Uh, I think that the, the most important role you have as a father, especially if you have sons, is to make them sensitive or to allow them to be sensitive because they'll carry that through the rest of their lives, you know, um, And it's not difficult. It just means you have to make that a priority, you know? And I think we, I think it's harder for men because when you have children, women have a lot of support networks built into society. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. have like mother uh, groups where they can meet and, you know, dads typically meet at the bar <laughs> This is right and, and because we don't have those support networks in, in, And men, it is much harder to show emotion. So that's why, you know, typically, yeah, you, you can only cry after five beers or whatever it is. Um, but I think if you start young, um, it's easy to kind of center men in the same way that women are centered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's just about education, loving your kids and, and not, um, not thinking about it in gender terms really, because I also know a lot of young girls who don't receive that love from yeah, totally. their parents yeah, yeah, totally. and they, you know, from an objective standpoint, seem much more masculine mm -hmm. than my sons who are super gentle and like would never hurt a frog or, you know, and you can, you can see that immediately. Oh, that's very true. And to come back, to come back to how, well, You you told me you you don't like to be described as a as a fashion photographer. Yeah, uh, I, I hate it. Which you are. I mean, uh, that's how you well, describe. Yeah, that's what is written in Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't write that. But, no, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I find it. You know, it's a very reductive title because yes, I do operate in fashion and I make pictures for fashion magazines, um, but it's really a fraction of what I do. Like I do, I paint, I write poetry, I publish books, I curate a magazine of painting and photography. Um, I just did an album with another musician. So I dabble in music from a sort of directorial perspective. I helped make two perfumes. Like I'm always interested in, in how to express the sort of world that I want to create with any medium. So it could be, maybe I'll collaborate with an industrial designer and make a chair or whatever. It's easier for people to pinpoint you as one thing and to sort of talk about it. But specifically yeah. with fashion, it's like, you know, the idea of a fashion photographer is very, it's a bit crass, you know, it's like <laughs> you think of like blow up um, or the sort of like, very much taking from women and yeah, this we have of, a lot of cliche actually <laughs> yeah you know and especially coming off of the last five years of me too and totally. um you know when people are like oh you're the fashion guy it's like well no i mean i mean that's yeah, a part you know and i, I use do. fashion but i don't even think that uh, i don't really describe my pictures as fashion pictures you know i think of them more as landscape and figurative works As a that just happen to have fashion in them, you know. And so there's a question I wanted to ask, but there's another question I'm thinking about. So um, I'll, uh, I'm gonna. What is the world that you want to create? The world that I want to create. Because you said uh, that's what you said. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's a very 
it's a very idealistic, uh, safe, beautiful kind of utopian world of, of, you know, humans existing in nature and in, in a, in a very, uh, sort of, um, story, story, fairy tale way, right. you know, this sort of children's book idea of it, of a world where we acknowledge how beautiful the earth is and we acknowledge how beautiful we are and there's love and it's, and it's about beauty, not on this sort of surface facade level, but on like a true, um, sort of utopian level, you know? And so the second question I was thinking about, but then you made the connection that it's perfect. So for you, because nature is very, uh, is very present in your artwork. Yeah. So what is for you? I mean, Especially, we talk a lot about ecology. I mean, less so in the U.S. <laughs> I mean, we talk a lot about. No, we about talk it. about it in the U.S. They they just don't do anything about <laughs> just, it. Well, they just we ignore it. We don't do much in Europe either. But yeah. uh, we will have we will we will have to come to it at some yeah. point. Um, what is what is the position of nature uh, in in your mind, and so why do you put it in your pictures? Well, so I grew up painting landscapes with my mother, so that was always sort of the basis of how I learned to look at art. But I also live in the countryside. You know, right. I live in a very forested, large uh, property where you can't really see the neighbors and we have a babbling brook. And, you know, my day-to-day -day life with my kids has been being in the brook, playing in nature, taking walks, going to the lake, you know, and swimming and being outside. And so I think my actual life predominantly when I'm not traveling for work is existing in nature. Right. And, um, I find it very necessary because, um, we forget, especially when we're in cities, we forget how big the world truly is. And, um, in nature, big and small, I would say, big, yeah, big and small. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also too small, but, um, no, I can explain. Well, yeah. Sorry, I can't. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nature is a part of my life, and it it only makes sense that it's a part of my work. Right. So you you live in the city, or you live? In... No, I live two nor two hours north oh, in right. the in the countryside. Right. Like right. proper countryside. That's that's good for the kid. It's great for the kids because the, the New York City is not. No. <laughs> I mean, I live there and it's I did, not... I did as well for 10 years. <laughs> it's not... Yeah. For the kids, it's not perfect, let's no. say. So upstate New York, it is. Is it? Uh, so it's it's in Connecticut, but it's... Okay. But, but yeah, essentially, yeah. but it's Connecticut, so it's more beautiful. <laughs> I, I don't know Connecticut. The minute you cross the border into New York, you're like, ah, shit, I'm in New York. Because it just doesn't quite look as nice. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Um, so nature, uh, very important nature and i was talking about the small world because to me somehow we talk a lot about borders mm -hmm. uh, i mean we talked a lot about borders with trump for sure yeah and but we still do uh, a lot and we talk about migrants we talk about i mean the ecological crisis we're going to go through and that's why i said this is also a small world because we are all in this small blue bubble that is only blue in a very dark universe. And yes. that's why I said it's also small. It's huge and it's small because yeah. we should take care of it. That, that's, yeah. that was my thinking, actually. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and I think, you know, the world that we literally live in, like our property, is this sort of utopian, ideal, idealized uh, garden um, where we're very fortunate that we have that because as the world warms, as we all know, it is, um, at a rapid rate that, you know, we're seeing the consequences every second. Um, the sort of landscape that we occupy now is very, it's, it's going to be more and more rare, you know? Totally. And there's a question I, I like to ask photographs and artists uh, in general matters is that whatever you put into the world and, and as a photographer, you have a responsibility because you, you put image out there. Yeah. How, how do you see this responsibility? How, how do you envision that? Or do you think about it when you create uh, art and 
uh, w when you create music or painting, uh, it doesn't have to be photography, basically. But what is your thinking? Because you're putting something out there and it has an impact on people eventually. Yeah, I think, I think first of all, you, you know, everything that you make is essentially... Uh, Every, all of your experiences until that point unconsciously are put into a piece of work. So every right. good, bad, love, trauma, it, it all will come out whether or not you, you acknowledge it. But I do think as an artist, you have a responsibility to, to do, first of all, what you truly do believe in as opposed to what you think people want you to do. And I think when you're successful, it's when you're, you're being true to yourself And, and you adhere to things that you really stand behind. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, for me, I want to see a beautiful world and I want to see people being nice to each other. And, and, and I want to see a colorful landscape that is untouched and vivid. And those are all things that I, I want for the world. Right. Um, and so when I make art, I want that to be my art. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to comment on the bad things that I see around me because I already see them and I don't think it's necessary to regurgitate it, you know? Right. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very interesting point of view because We talk a lot about these days, at least engagement. Uh, everybody is somehow engaged, um, and usually when we talk about engagement, we talk about cause, and it has to be, you know, uh, Black Lives Matters or, uh, or or feminism or uh, I mean any kind of cause. Uh, could be animals, could be whatever. Yeah. And what you're saying somehow is not being engaged for cause, but being engaged for beauty. And well, I think, I think the, when you start talking about, um, the sublime and, you know, beauty is kind of a word that the art world hates. Um, but beauty is interchangeable. You could, if you're real, you know, real religious person, you would talk about God, uh, a more apt term would be the sublime. I think when you're talking about something that unites all of us in, in under the realization, we're going to die, we're born, we're going to die. And yes, you, I'm white and I'm straight and I'm a man. Um, do I believe black lives matter? Of course. Do I need to get behind it on Instagram every day? No, absolutely not. I think, you know, when you are, are truly trying to create what you believe in and beauty in your own terms, you're doing a good cause for society. Um, I think that now we are so preoccupied with narcissism that appears to be this sort of inward looking journey that actually is just dividing us further and further and further. And we forget that um, we are all the same, not treated. We're not treated by society the no, same. No. I would never pretend that for a second, you know, and, But, but there are things that unite all of us. And like, it's interesting when you, when you take people from different, all different walks of life, different socioeconomic backgrounds, gender backgrounds, race, and you show them art from all different cultures. If it's African art, New Guinea art, uh, European painting from the 1800s, whatever, mm -hmm. that is art is the language that we can all participate in and and you don't have to like the mona lisa but you will you'll be able to engage with it as would um somebody else who's being shown it from a, a totally different background and you'll ha of course have a different experience but it, it, it's the thing that is the melting pot you know every culture since the beginning of time has created art because it is expression. And that mm. is what as humans, we need to express ourselves. We need to get our emotions out. We need to get our pain out and our love out and all these things. And art is truly the way that we can do that as a society w without 
having to specifically say trans right matters, black lives matter. Of You know, I say, of course it does. Obviously not everybody says that. No, obviously half, not. Half the population, you know, because of lack of education and probably because they were beat as children and, you know, they have racist parents and whatever the thing is, of course they want to push back. But I think, um, in some romantic vision in my head, I think art kind of like clears the table and it's the one space, whether it's music, painting, photography, uh, perfume, whatever, where we can all engage as people. And, and it is a safe space, um, to just kind of be yourself. Yeah. It's quite amazing to listen to you, to listening to you because we can, sense your sensibility so that's that's very uh, that's very touching and it's very interesting and at the same time I was wondering because at the beginning you talked a lot about um, you know reading all those books and how do you I, I was wondering how do you connect this need to go into the books and know everything not by heart but to know every current every photographers every artist or every you know you were talking about romanticism being uh, German um, and you know, sensibility, which is, when sensitivity, yeah, which is, you know, like an expression of, uh, of vulnerability. And I, 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 I feel that if you're in a medium, so like, for example, when I collaborated on making these two perfumes, um, you know, I felt the need to really dive into like the history perfume and like also contemporary noses, like other people who are making perfumes, like, I, or when I'm, doing photography like I feel it's completely necessary to know what's come before of course I don't know everything at all nearly no. but I, I can I can know as much as I can know nobody does no, no of course nobody <laughs> the, yeah the smart man says he knows nothing but um but I do think it, it's not to try to avoid something that's been done before because we're always doing something that's been done before but I think the more you know um the more you can truly create something without feeling like, Oh shit, I just copied somebody because they copied somebody and that goes infinitely all the way around. Um, and then you can kind of let go and make your own work. So you, it's, it's very funny because I'm not sure a lot of artists would accept the idea because a lot of people because of narcissism they want to say I'm a creator I create things and a few of them say yeah well actually nobody's creates shit I mean usually <laughs> you inspire you are inspired by you, whatever <laughs> yeah you you create um and you're inspired by everything that you've seen and you felt uh, like every like I said every work of art you make is is literally all of your moments that you've existed in up until that point that will come out subconsciously mm. in the thing. Totally. And um, it just helps to have more tools in your belt to know more mm -mm. when you're making. Um, and it's easy to say you make a picture or you become known for some style for a period of time. Then somebody comes around and you're like, oh, that's my picture. But it's like, that was never your picture. You were influenced by all these other things prior to that. And it's a continuum and that's how art works. Mm. Um, And the, the sooner you can kind of let go of that, of that ownership over a thing, because when you create a work of art, you give it to the world. The mm -hmm. minute you make it, it's not yours anymore. And your name might be on it, but the world is enjoying it on for free on the internet. And you yet know people I mean? are paying for it. I yeah, mean, they're I paying mean, for it when you buy art. Well, it's just like, yeah, the monetary side is a whole other com conversation. But yeah. I think, um, I think it's important for artists to realize that, you're not making it for yourself and for uh, fame and money. If you're a true artist, you're making it because you have to make it for yourself. And it's yeah. a, it's a form of meditation and it's a form of giving back to the world. You know, yeah, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly how I feel with my podcast somehow. It's not, <laughs> it's not art at all. No, but it could be, I but, mean, this could be art. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, but uh, that's how I feel. I mean, I, I, to me, I, first I, I do it for myself because I, I love talking to people yeah. and I'm super curious and I, I don't know. And, and the pleasure that I have to share those conversations with others, because I mean, I can have this, I mean, we could have that conversation together and not recording and, of course. you know, 
and but I I, I I I take a lot of pleasure of sharing. Yeah. And to me, yeah, it's not my. I mean, podcast is for free for sure. <laughs> that yeah. Nobody's gonna buy anything. So, uh, yeah, the, that's exactly what I feel. So it's not art. I mean, it could be. I don't know. Maybe the the world would tell me. Maybe later. one day this will be <laughs> this will be the most avant garde conceptual art. I will be know? an NFT, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> then I then I will call you and ask for a percent. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's exactly how I feel. Um, one question that is uh, maybe stupid, but I, I think it's interesting. What is the question that nobody is asking you, but you would love people to ask you? Hmm. That is a good question. Well, nobody asked me many original questions anyway, so there's probably quite a list. But <laughs> typically, you know, I they, hope I did a little bit. No, 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 no. It's fine. <laughs> typically, you know, they're asking the same. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Uh, like, what kind of camera do you use? Or yeah, when no. do you, whatever. Hopefully um, I didn't ask that. No, 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 <laughs> you didn't. Um, I think that, you know, I, I would want the world to really understand that what I do isn't just photography. And it's, it is difficult. It's like um, if you be, become known as an actor and then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, but I want to make a music album. Um, it doesn't matter if you're Brad Pitt or whoever, they're going to be like, yeah, but you're just an actor. So it's very hard for society to see people in different mediums and doing well. You know, a good example of that would be like Steve Martin, who, of course, for decades was SNL, uh, one of the most famous comedians. And then, you know what? He wrote four or five, I don't even know, six books. And he's a fantastic author. He writes proper literature. He is taken seriously, kind of, but people would still say you're just an actor. Right. And I think what's difficult is when you do have, uh, when you do want to communicate to the world in different mediums and you are good at more than one medium to convey that and have people accept you in, on different terms. And I think oftentimes people don't ask me about, you know, curating books or painting or other things that do fall in the same category as my overarching work. And I feel like that's a little bit unfortunate because if they were to, there'd probably be more interesting conversations that would come. So you want to have a zoom out? Yeah, I think it, I think, um, it would be nice for people to be a bit more, uh, macro in their questioning yeah. than micro, you know, for sure. And so, Obviously, I'm going to ask a question about that. Yeah, <laughs> That's logical, right? Otherwise, I'm I would not be going like, to talk about it. <laughs> but I don't want to talk about it. No, but what what is the connection for you between all those things that you're doing, like uh, creating uh, art, creating books? Sorry. Uh, well, I, I I think it's the desire to participate in all the things that I love. Yeah, so like you explain so like, so like for me, you know, music has always been the highest. If you're going to make a hierarchy of the arts, you know. Music is always the most important. Oh, also because it, it's a the truly existential medium where you, it's non physical. You have to enter it. You have to bring yourself into it. You can uh, you go into your own world when you hear music, and it's totally unique to you, and it isn't a shared space with anybody else. So I think by definition, music is um, the most important art. Uh, and then to be fair. You know, sculpture, you also enter in a physical space. Although the, the thing that I love most is painting. Um, that's my favorite medium. And also there's a bond with your, with yeah, your mom. I mean, for many reasons. Um, but I think, and I love perfumes. So I wanted to make my, I think when I love things, I want to participate. And so it could be one day that I'll make clothing yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, I love clothes and I love fashion. So maybe one day I'll wake up and be like, Hey, I have to do like a, a collection. Um, and maybe it would just be a one time thing, but at least I'll have tried and participated and like put my own sort of stamp on it. Um, so somehow what you're saying, tell me if it's wrong, but you, you, you have energy and you send that energy in the world within different media, right? Yeah, absolutely. Medium. Yeah, that's that's exactly that, right? Yeah. And photography happens to be the one you're famous for, but yeah. but it's it's an energy that you are like spreading around. Uh, yeah, and I think I also just think I I get bored quite easily. So for me it's like you know, I've been doing photography for 20 
four years almost. And, and at a certain point, you know, the work has evolved, but there comes a point where it's like, yeah, I just want to try other things because why not? You know what I mean? Like we're, we're alive once <laughs> we might as well have a laugh, you know, yeah. and like, and try our hand at different things. Like, you know, a lot of the, the famous photographers that I grew up with who have died recently. And I know I shouldn't say this, but like somebody like Peter Lindbergh, for example, mm. who obviously was a legend, yeah. but when he died and, and I was actually at a dinner for uh, celebrating his death in Paris oh, quite wow. soon afterwards, you know, I was actually a bit sad by his career because he had taken the same picture for 40 years over and over and over. And I was like, look, if I die and I've just taken the same picture my whole life, that would be really fucking depressing. <laughs> actually, you know what? I've met him uh, a few weeks before he died. Yeah. And he did this book uh, f with uh, Giacometti, I mean Giacometti, with this uh, artwork. Because, I mean, the guy <laughs> yeah. is uh, dead uh, uh, since a long time, but he did a, a whole book of uh, sculpture. And But, I mean, for sure, nobody knows about that because, I mean, he was so well known for fashion photography that, I mean, those photos, uh, they were like an expression of still photos, but... yeah. But yeah, and when you when you when you go into the world of fashion photography, I mean it's it's a commodity first, you know, you're selling a commodity, um, but you yourself are a commodity, like any other artist in a sense, but in fashion it's hi more heightened because you're hired for a style. And so the magazines sort of want you to just do what you do over and over and over and over. Um but somebody who operates in fashion who I don't actually like his work but I really respect his process is like Steven Meisel mm -hmm. who, yeah, maybe you could draw an aesthetic thread, but traditionally like he was more interested in the, in, in creating something new every time and being not necessarily known for a s aesthetic stamp, but creating these sort of commentaries, um, that I find more interesting even though that kind of contradicts what I was saying earlier, but I, I find it more interesting than spending your life creating the same piece of work over and over and over, which to be fair, even in the art world, you know, if you look at, um, Donald Judd or, or Rothko or whoever, that is also kind of true. Yeah. But then you look at somebody like Lucian Freud, you look at his early work, And you look at the work he's making at the end of his life, they couldn't be more different. Look at Picasso. I mean, exactly. Picasso is amazing. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> he was such a fine painter. Was like, he was so precise. And then, I mean, people just known threw for, it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then he's known for what you know, like, uh, which is uh, inspiration from African. Um, of course. And, uh, And so, not for his fine art of uh, artwork. And, and when you look at a, at a painting, a, a very early painting he did, nobody recognized Picasso because, well, like, yeah. he's not known for that. Yeah. But he, he, he actually reinvented himself somehow. But yeah, he, re he reinvented himself every, every two years, which is why he's regarded as the, the, the you know, most important modern artist. Although I would say I don't like his work, okay. but I like <laughs> what he fine. did, which is fine. <laughs> I don't derive any pleasure from looking at it, but I do uh, obviously acknowledge his importance and appreciate what he did for them, for, for art in general to, to take it from one place to the next. Um, but it's rare for artists to be able to do that. Yeah. And you know? how do you reinvent yourself? I mean, how do you do it? And how, how are you going to do it in the coming, in the coming years? Uh, whether it's photography or whatever art. I mean, I think that, if, like I was trying to say earlier, art should really just be a reflection of where you are yeah, at that period of time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as I get older, you know, like once I had kids, I started photographing my, my family. That became a book this year that was the last five years of my life. So I'm constantly just doing what my life is doing. And wherever I go, my work is going to change. Right. And what happens to me in my life affects my work. Like the record I made because my mother died right. and it, it became a sort of spiritual guide 
for her to leave this world while she was dying. And that was a direct response to what was happening in my life. Um, you know, in two, two years from now, like who knows yeah. what's happening and mm -hmm. my work could be completely different and I could be only making paintings. And like I say, you know, I've done photography, it's over. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's, that's the part where you have to be true to yourself. So you're not forcing it. You're just listening into yourself. I mean, you're I very think, connected to yourself basically. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it comes from a place of the romanticism to go full circle yeah, is, yeah. is really, about letting go and, and, and allowing your sort of, uh, trusting in the universe that what you're making is really a reaction to how you're feeling about your place in the world at that time. Right. I think that's really what it is. And that place in the world is constantly changing, you know, so it would only make sense that the work would change as well. Super interesting. And so as a last question, I told you it would be the last question. Yeah. Um, what would you <laughs> open or slam the door to? Open or slam the door to you. It can be regarded to our conversation. Could be uh, yeah. <laughs> not connected to the conversation. Um, Could be anything. I mean, I think um, I would slam the door on... Uh, I, would put, I would slam the door or put a pause on how drastically fast, well, the, the world is ending in terms of climate, but also in terms of how, ironically, we're getting more conservative uh, as a, as a, as a overarching culture around the world. You have these, these uh, governments that are coming in that are reminding us of like 1930s. And it's very, very strange because you have simultaneously, you know, the liberation of, of small sects of society like mm -hmm. trans rights and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gay rights and women are much more empowered today, even though ironically by law, they're not in the United States while totally. women seem that they're getting more rights, abortion rights are being taken away. Exactly, and like, yeah. But all these things are just so counterproductive to us as a species when really, if we don't get climate change under control, my children might not live to be, 30. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that in itself isn't about race, gender, um, anything to do with identity. It affects all of us. And unfortunately also disproportionately affects those who are not white and not wealthy. Um, and I would slam the door on just the bureaucracy that is preventing us from doing the things that would actually bring change to help all people. Yeah. You know? Slams it all to modern society. As we, yeah. <laughs> as we yeah. discussed somehow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, cool. thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That yes. was great. Thanks. Pleasure. <laughs> Merci d'avoir écouté Vlan. Si vous avez aimé l'émission, n'hésitez pas à mettre des étoiles sur vos plateformes de podcast préférées. Vous pouvez aussi partager l'épisode sur vos réseaux sociaux, Instagram Stories, Facebook, LinkedIn, où vous voulez. Je suis Grégory Pouy. Vous pouvez me retrouver sur l'intégralité des plateformes sous le nom Greg from Paris. Si vous avez des idées pour des invités, si vous avez des commentaires, n'hésitez surtout pas à m'envoyer un message. Allez, merci et à bientôt